Well, after my first video, people have been asking me to do another one, so I thought I'd do this one on something that no one talks about, and that is wet flow and homogeneousness in the combustion chamber and how we counteract things as far as lean and rich areas in the combustion chamber. Um, some people have asked, uh, how did you get your start? Um, when did you start in this industry? I've been doing cylinder heads, designing induction systems professionally now for 35 years. Um, uh, but actually I've been around it my whole life. Um, both my father and stepfather uh, were drag racers. Uh, my stepfather was Kip Martin and owned a shop in Augusta, Kansas. And uh, he basically taught my brother and I how to build racing engines. And from there we just took off and my brother's still the uh, head engine builder at Rara Morrison. And this is him on the hood of my father's race car in 1973. So by the time we were 12, we'd been to pretty much every NHRA track in the country. Now, I've been around this my whole life. And I would say, I would, you know, even though I've been doing this for 35 years, 36 years, I really have to say that the first 10 years were just trying to absorb enough knowledge to pretty much know what I was doing. So you could say that really at a professional, a high professional, I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, you know, what I'm about to talk about is something that no one in the industry talks about. And a lot of things that I talk about, no one talks about. And it's not for their lack of knowledge. On the contrary, um, I can think of 20 people offhand that know exactly what I know. It's just, I'm the only one out here actually willing to talk about it and, and put this into a, a PowerPoint format and, and uh, let's see. Okay, here, here you see, oh, by the way, um, I blew everything up and I've made this camera go dark because you really don't want to see my big head anyway. You want to see the pictures. So I'm going to go, my face is going to go in and out here. Um, this is a picture of a, let's see, this is an SB2 combustion chamber. And I wanted to point something out. Um, one is, is the valve job and how I do it. And I uh, cut this with uh, shallower angles and then blend it by hand, which takes a lot of time. But you still see one definition angle. This is the 60, this is a 55 degree seat, 65. And then I'll cut it 70 and then 80, and then by the time I blend it, this radius comes off here at about a 75 and an 85. So you have to have one, at least one uh, defined angle, what we call in wet flow terminology a vaporization ridge, and I'll show you all these pictures here in a little bit. Um, you can also notice that the combustion chamber is just an extension of the seat, and usually if you have a 55 degree seat, this combustion chamber will be about 50 degrees. So it's only 10 degrees off the valve angle. What you don't see here is a nasty ridge around here. And these combustion chambers nowadays, um, you, you look at the, the, the seats, the contouring and the combustion chambers that say MAST or BMB, um, Matt Bieneman, CFE, um, all, you know, Bob at Pro One. These combustion chambers and seats are designed specifically for the case that it's going to be used in. And I see this all the time that people just destroy the dynamics of the combustion chamber because they'll take the cylinder head to someone who, who is really not knowing what they're doing and they'll cut these seats and change those angles and a lot of time they'll just cut them down and leave a huge ridge and not blend that back into the combustion chamber. Later on I'm going to show you how detrimental that is. It's absolutely horrible. If, if you, let's, let's say you buy a, a, a set of heads from CFE or BME or, or, or myself um, uh, at BES, the best thing you can do, the biggest favor you can do yourself is to send that particular cylinder head, who ha which has been specifically designed by that entity for your combination, send it back to them to be valve job. If you're even a little bit in doubt, because I see this all the time that you, you can take a perfectly designed head and, and, and this is finite. This is really, really touchy. Um, 
back in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, ports weren't this efficient. They weren't tuned to the razor's edge. So you could go in there and do a sloppy valve job and it probably wouldn't hurt you too bad. Nowadays, oh my God, you can kill 40 like that if you come in here and change these angles and make a ridge around there. 40 horsepower, boom, gone. I see it every day. I talk to customers all the time that have sent their heads out and gotten valve jobs and said, where'd that tenth of a second go? Where'd my mile an hour go? It's gone. And it doesn't matter what you do as far as tuning, jetting, timing, or anything else. You can't make it up because this is the most critical area in the entire induction system. One inch below this seat and one inch above it controls almost 50%. So when you have something tuned this finite, any little change will affect the flow curve. And if you, these throats are also to critical max on a lot of engines because these engines nowadays work, operate at higher engine speeds at higher volumetric efficiencies than ever before. So we push these throats out right to the maximum allowed. So somebody goes in, changes this angle and drops that and then tries to blend it in. Now your throat's too big, your pressure drop, you can't get a proper pressure drop here and you can't move air into the cylinder. What that does is it makes the engine lazy. It makes it non-reactive and what we call a numb engine combination. It's numb to change. You can change the timing, the jetting or anything. It's going to run the same. And nine times out of 10, when you have an engine that's numb, unresponsive to change, it's an airspeed problem almost every time. And it's usually right here, one inch below the seat and one inch above it. So now that I've got on that little diatribe, we'll go, I'll move on. <coughs> Now you can see here that this combustion chamber, again, is an extension of that seat. This all flows in, in in a very specific way. These angles are all set so you're not disturbing the air and it can go around that corner. And the most important part of this is the pressure recovery around the valve. Meaning, if, if, you, uh, if you take a valve and you just open it into atmosphere, meaning there's no combustion chamber walls there. Later on, I'm going to show you how bad and how detrimental that is. But what happens is you can't recover the pressure. When that valve opens, it has to see a wall. So incrementally, as the valve opens and the flow increases, you're controlling that pressure recovery. If you knock it back too much, it just goes turbulent and shuts the flow zone down. So anybody that goes in and, and uh, lays these chambers back on a real high-end cylinder head, what, what, what you'll see is on the flow bench, it'll flow more air down at two, three, four hundred lift. You'll actually gain airflow. And this is where the flow bench lies to you. And it, there's a lot of cases where the flow bench lies to you, but this is one of the worst and most detrimental ways. <coughs> so, and I've had customers, one customer in Australia specifically, um, and this was back in 2002, sent, I sent a set of SB2 heads and it was a high speed engine. I mean, this thing had to make peak torque at 8,000 RPM. So um, the chamber walls are, were really, really tight. So he got on the flow bench and he looked at it and he thought, well, I'm just, after he run the engine, he was freshening the heads up. He got the idea in his head. He said, well, I'm just gonna lay that combustion chamber wall back. And sure enough on the flow bench, it picked up eight CFM at two, three, 400 lift. So in, you know, you're thinking, well, heck, that's a gain. The flow bench is telling me that's a gain. It's not, you killed the pressure recovery. On the flow bench at 28 inches test pressure, you can do stuff like this. And then the running engine at 150, it's gonna go completely nuts. So what he did was he laid that back, he killed the pressure recovery and it went turbulent. He lost 15 foot pounds of torque, just like that. These are tuned <laughs> to a razor's edge. Any change is going to affect the, the power band of that engine. Now there's more than one way to skin this cat. See, I, I use a radius into one defined angle, into the seat defined angle, and then the chamber is another angle. You don't have to do it this way. The only reason I do it this way is because Shepard did it this way, Lee Shepard did it this way, and the guy who taught me how to do it did it this way, so I do it this way. But there's another way too. You can use defined angles. It's harder, it's more difficult, but it's a lot easier to blend into the bowl that way. So these angles are shallow. They're only changing maybe 10 degrees max at a time. 
But you see also, this combustion chamber, you cannot see a defined ridge around here. There's no transition off of the seat. It goes 45 or, or let's say this is a 55 degree seat. That chamber is still 50 degrees. It's only a 10 degree change off of the seat. And I'll, I'll make other videos here later on showing how to derive a proper valve job. But let's just say this right off the bat. You can't turn the air any more than 15 degrees at a time. You can't do it. It's going to break the boundary layer. It's going to go turbulent. It's going to screw up the flow curve. It's going to kill it up high or kill it down low or one or the other. Now I'm going to talk about manifold runners. Why do we make manifold runners straight and why is bending the runner or making a nice smooth arc detrimental? Now over the last 10, 15 years especially, what you will notice comparing the old manifolds from the 80s and 90s to the manifolds now, you'll see that the runners have been stood up, they're a lot straighter, and they're straighter side to side. They're just leaning them in. The, the worst thing you can do is try to take the opening from the plenum and curve it into the runner. You don't want to curve it into the runner because Air doesn't want to turn. See, here we see this is all dead area. The flow is this way. So this would be like the long bend on a, on a manifold runner. Here's a high velocity area and here's a high velocity area. This has broken the boundary layer and gone turbulent here. When this comes around, the flow line actually moves ahead and then at this point the air tries to go up the runner. This is literally a vortex trying to go back up that runner and it chokes that flow zone down, way down. This is the reason why we've gotten completely away from making nice smooth gradual angles. I would rather have a manifold with straight runners, and this is one of my manifolds, a straight runner that goes into the port and makes one turn. I can manage one turn. I can actually come in, tape, taper that runner down and make one turn right at that push rod. I can manage that. That's easy to manage. And you're not going to be killing the energy of the flow when you make them straight. You're going to have a nice straight shot at the valve. And I always talk about line of sight and, and deleting velocity gradients. Get those out of the system. Here's a manifold that I designed at Profiler. And this is the, the tunnel ram manifold for um, conventional big block Chevy heads. <coughs> now, at the time that I designed this manifold, and even still today, most racers, bracket racers or uh, super gas um, racers, pro gas, what, what they do is they limit the engine's RPM potential. They, they don't want to shift the engine over 7,500. And, and that's just for longevity. Um, the TBO, or time between overhauls, um, is, is much higher if you shift the engine lower or build the power band in the engine lower and operate it at a lower engine speed. Anytime you start increasing engine speed, your TBO, or time between overhauls, decreases, and it decreases rapidly. Um, if you made your peak torque at 7,500, I've seen racers like Scotty Richardson run an engine 400 runs before it got freshened. And granted, it was extremely tired after that, but you can get a lot of runs out of those engines. If, you turn, if you're turning at 8,500, you just cut your TBO in half. You get maybe 150, 200 runs at that point. So this manifold's runner length is harmonically tuned to 7,500 RPM on a standard conventional cylinder head. <coughs> but you notice the runners are straight. Now, if you look at the old Wyan or Holly manifolds for conventional big block Chevys that they designed back in the 70s, these runners are, are hooked this way, they're arced this way, and they're arced side to side a little bit. And all that did was reduce the amount of air you get in there because the boundary layer is breaking downstream. You can't turn it. It's not a good idea to try to turn the air gradually. I always say that this stuff is not aerodynamically intuitive. It, it, if it looks aerodynamic, it, you got a large chance of it not working in the running engine. It, it's, it's not, you can't, yeah, don't do that. 
<coughs> so I'd rather come down here straight and make one turn into the runner, both sideways and up. And, and I can navigate that. I can handle that. But you can't make air do what it doesn't want to do, and it doesn't want to go around a corner. Now this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is that same manifold in cast form with a single plane manifold. And I want to talk a little bit about runner distribution. Now, these runners have a slight arc in them, just slight, not a big one, um, but just enough to try to move them in underneath the Venturis. In hindsight, I mean, this manifold's 20 some years old, in hindsight, probably would have made those straighter, straight and it probably would have been a little better. But if you look here, we have carburetor Venturis that are situated over the middle runners. Taking a manifold like this, that's designed for two carburetors, so the boosters or the <clears throat> the blades are right over the runners, and then putting a single carburetor on it. It's not a bad idea, but it's tricky. You really got to know what you're doing to get that fuel to move all the way to these outside runners, because and you usually have to have a very tall, tall pent roof, which increases your plenum volume, which for high speed engines usually isn't that bad of a deal, especially with one carburetor. The plenum volume is relative to RPM. So what happens is, is the center runners, if you don't do this correctly, and again, it's touchy, if you don't do this correctly, the center runners get more fuel than the outer runners, which these are lean, these are rich. So also, G-forces. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's go back to this manifold. This manifold, this is the front, these manifolds have to put up have to launch at three G's plus. So what happens is the air comes out of the booster and over five inches that air will move back at three and a half G's about four hundred thousandths. And people wonder why their front runners are leaning out. So all we do is move the carburetors ahead six hundred and fifty thousandths and it evens the distribution up. This is uh, that same manifold, and you see that it, it's oval. Um, back then, it was, it's a lot easier to produce this manifold in oval form, or at least at the time than it was um, around. I'll show you a round opening. But you notice the runners are just lean. There's no arc, there's no curve. Everything is straight, straight, straight. Now, the, these radiuses here are, become very touchy when it comes to high-speed engines. Engines like this that operate at 7,500, 8,000, you can go in there and increase that a little bit and go from a half inch to a, let's say a 5 eighths radius and you're not gonna see that much difference. Especially on a lower RPM manifold because taper is relative to engine speed. And I'll, I'll touch on that here in just a little bit. Now this is a round runner. This is a cast manifold. So the radiuses are, are rather large on this because it's a low RPM manifold with low taper, decreased taper. In other words, the runner is almost straight. Now the, the engine speed increases, the taper increases. And I'll tell you that why here in just a second. So as that runner taper increases, this radius gets smaller and smaller. This is uh, what I call the poor man's wet flow bench. Dicom. Um, this is a pro stock manifold from 2006, I think. Um, the runners are much shorter now because the RPM, the engine in speed, has gone up so much. <coughs> so, this is Dicom that has been shot in the booster. So, on the flow bench, it's bolted to the cylinder head and all the runners are taped off. Everything is taped off and blocked off except for these two runners. So these are, the, these are the only two runners taking air and each one is flowed separately. What I've done here is put the carburetor on there and taken the butterfly out and actually put red and blue dicum into the booster. Take the uh, block off and just stick the tube into the booster. So on this one I would stick the tube into the booster with just a tube going into a bottle of Dicom and stick that in the booster and count one, two, three, four, and then pull it out and then do the other side with blue and go one, two, three, four, and then pull it out. 
So I tried to get an even amount in both runners so what I was seeing wasn't skewed. This, run, this radius right here is a 3 8 radius. This runner right here is a quarter inch radius. And a quarter inch radius is really tiny. So you're thinking, why would you use such a small radius on the opening of a runner? Again, aerodynamically, this is not intuitive. This is not what you would call aerodynamic. Um, it looks wrong, but it's right in this particular instance. <clears throat> Again, remember I said that as the engine speed increases, you increase the taper. Well, this runner, or both of these runners, violate proper Venturi design. In other words, the wall angle itself is 7.5 degrees. If you're designing a runner, or a, a runner, a Venturi, you want that pressure recovery angle underneath the Venturi to be no more than seven degrees per wall or 14 degrees included. The reason for that is, and you can look it up on the internet, just look at the uh, flow field distribution or look at uh, a Venturi design and you'll, and you'll see that if you increase that angle underneath the Venturi too much, the air will break away from the walls. You'll get turbulent flow, the boundary layer will break. And the more air you try to shove through it, the more turbulent it gets and it starts shutting down that flow zone. Well, on the inlet, it's the same thing. If you tapered it too much, the airflow would be too small up here, too, air, the air speed would be too low up here, and the air could not turn into the runner because the airspeed here is what grabs that fuel. The pressure differential at the opening of that runner is what pulls the fuel into the runner. So we were running 3 eighths of an inch and we went to quarter of an inch and the fuel flow instantly picked up and the engine power increased. And I mean, I didn't invent this. This is something that I saw and then went, okay, we're gonna try that. And we tried it and it was like magic at the time. And we're thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, why does this work? Then I'm a gearhead. I have to know how this thing works. I, I don't care how deep the black hole is. I have got to know why this works at a fundamental level, or I'm just, I'm not satisfied. So I started looking at the walls and the air speeds. And it really had, it didn't have much to do with the actual air speed. It had more to do with the shear effect. So what we did is we went from seven degrees per wall to seven and a half, and taper is a way to gain volume in the runner. I'll touch on that in a second. Went to seven and a half, we needed more volume, we went to seven and a half, which violates the Venturi design rules. And you can't adhere to the walls. Well, in a running engine, you're flowing fuel with the air, and the droplet size coming out of that Venturi is really important. That's why you see all these carb guys in there messing with air bleeds all the time. You're controlling the size of that droplet, droplet size. So you have to turn that into the runner. Well, the last thing you want it to do on a big opening runner like this is shoot down and hit the floor, not be able to turn in the runner because you're not dropping the pressure here enough to turn it into the runner. You can see here, this is a lot more than this. A lot more of that fuel went down, was not able to be pulled into that runner and sm smashed onto the floor where it doesn't do any good because all this fuel does is trail down the floor, which is always the slowest area. As far as the velocity gradient from roof to floor, the, the roof is almost always higher. So you can see this. It didn't shear the fuel off of this wall. It's coating the walls here, and it forms this nasty trail coming in. This is all fuel that goes into the combustion chamber. This trails all the way down to the short side and makes its turn around the short side. And later on, I'm gonna show you how bad that really gets. Because all this fuel that goes into the combustion chamber, it burns too late to create usable cylinder pressure. It's not atomized. The whole idea here is to get the most homogeneous air fuel mixture in that combustion chamber that you possibly can. And that's in a perfect world. And we don't live in a perfect world. So we have to manage all this fuel dropout and fuel shear and sheeting on the walls. All that has to be taken into account. <coughs> 
So if you see here, the fuel trail coming off of the floor, it grabbed a lot more fuel going into this runner. It has a lot less fuel distributed on the floor, and the trail going into the runner is significantly less. And also, if you notice the walls, it detached the air. What happened was, this small radius shears the air off the runner. So you have the edge of the runner. Instead of coming in and conforming to that runner, it shoots off a bit. It shears that fuel. Now, if you looked at that aerodynamically, of course, it, it looks horrible. But in the running engine, dynamically, it's correct. Let's see if there's anything else. As engine speed increases, the taper, the taper of that runner increases. Producing peak torque at higher engine speeds requires a shorter and shorter runner. And harmonically, we're tuning these runners to, well, pulses bouncing back and forth. And the, short, the higher the RPM, the shorter time you have. So the shorter that runner gets to tune that system up. So now we have a problem. It becomes more difficult to balance the intake tract volume and airspeed. As you shorten that runner, you have less and less and less volume. So to counteract that, we increase the taper. But again, you can't increase the taper over seven degrees per wall, 14 degrees included. But I don't concentrate on angle. I don't care what the angle is because a lot of people will look at runner taper as an angle and you shouldn't do that. I don't care what the angle is, just so long as it doesn't violate the Venturi rules. Just so long as it doesn't violate 7 degrees per wall, 14 degrees included. Because this is the opening of these runners is based on volume and airspeed, not angle, taper angle. But I will say that the lower the engine RPM, the lower you're making, the lower the engine speed, the less taper you need. So this is why you see engines that operate at uh, 7,000 will only have about 10 to 15% volume uh, cross-sectional area increase relative to the valve. And as you increase engine speed, uh, you hit 8,000 and now you're at 20, 25%. And then you hit 9,000 and you're like 30, 35%. And this is area relative to the valve at the opening. And then by the time you get to 10, 11, 12,000, you're pushing that seven degrees per wall, 14 degrees included to the max, and because you need more volume, and your taper, your actual area ratio relative to the valve is like 50, 55% of the valve, which is about as big as you can get. <coughs> Increasing the runner angle, runner taper angle, allows us to balance average air speed and volume. But I will say this, again, it's not that we're concentrating on what the angle is. We're concentrating on what the airspeed and the volume is because you, you have to have a certain amount of airspeed at the opening or you're not going to drop the pressure. You're not going to turn those fuel, the fuel into the runner. Now I'm going to get to the wet flow. Back in 2000 at the PRI show, um, Joe Mondello and Lloyd Creek pulled me aside and took me to dinner and asked me what I thought about wet flow benches. And I had played around with wet flow benches. And basically at the time, we were using just water or a 50% water alcohol mix to lower the specific gravity with dye in there. And you really couldn't see a whole lot. I mean, you could see vortex generation, but you couldn't see the atomization of the plume. Uh, you couldn't see the vaporization ridges, which I'll show you here later. And the definition of what we were seeing wasn't really, you know, defined. So he had the idea, Mandelo and Lloyd Creek had the idea to put a, like a 50% water, 50% alcohol, and some a very special ultraviolet